Hi. You may have seen some headlines on microfinance, some that say we are ending world poverty, and others that say we're profiteering from the poor, and you may ask yourself, what, what do I believe? What should I believe? I hold the answer depends on a concept called transparency, and I run an organization called Microfinance Transparency. Uh, first of all, let's talk, what, what is microfinance? Uh, in the developing world, the majority of the poor are self-employed. They are farmers or market vendors or tailors. There are not um, very many salaried jobs, and so if you're going to feed your family, you create your own business. Microfinance started as a way to provide capital to those micro-enterprises so that people could build their business up, make more income, take care of their families better. Okay? Uh, today I want to explain why microfinance is in danger of losing its way and how a group of us are working hard to preserve the original vision. But I have a second goal today. I'm going to try and sneak this in. I'm not just going to tell you about complex financial tricks to, um, to take advantage of the poor. There's another valuable lesson. It's about how each of us has the potential to confront problems and create a spark that inspires others to, to address those problems as well. So back to microfinance. The story begins in 1976. Muhammad Yunus is a professor of economics in Bangladesh, probably the poorest country on earth at that time. And he's doing field research. He's interviewing wi women uh, in poverty. And they tell him that they, are in, they owe, have some debts to the moneylenders. He's moved by their situation and does what his heart leads him to do. He, takes some of his own money, it's only $25, and gives it to the women and says, pay off those loans. And he doesn't expect, he doesn't ask them to, to give that money back. He doesn't expect to see it again. But later those women do return the money. So he takes the money and gives it to another group of women. And the cycle continues. And the Grameen Bank is born, which now has 8 million clients with loans and has been um, the spark for creating a global industry that works with approximately 150 million people around the world. It was a brilliantly simple idea. Any of us could have done that simple act. And it began with that act motivated by compassion that led others to try similar actions and created a, a movement that some years later, 2006, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize. But just a few months later, the stories you would read took a dramatically different turn. The first was about an organization in, in Mexico that lends to women 125% interest, generates massive profits, does a stock IPO, and some people get really rich. Okay? Uh, a year later, it's a bank in Nigeria and the front page of the New York, New York Times says, banks making big profits from tiny loans. <laughs> a year later, it's India. And the banks, the microfinance banks in India have been expanding rapidly. They've saturated the market. They want to continue growing, so they give more loans to people that already have loans. The financial pressures of over-indebtedness lead to a number of suicides. This is a picture of a family holding a, 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 a drawing of their daughter, their 18-year-old daughter. She has left a tragic suicide note. Work hard and earn money. Do not take loans. You read this and you wonder what microfinance is, and we in the microfinance industry start to wonder what it is we have created. Okay. So a strenuous debate started up. Our primary concern was excess of profits, and profits come from prices. Microfinance was created to offer affordable prices to the poor, but our price system was extremely confusing, as I'm going to show you right now. Let's take some examples. Let's say you are looking for a loan, okay? 
and you go to the, uh, the first bank, says 0% interest and um, a 5% fee at uh, disbursement, okay? The second bank says 15% interest and they don't really explain what that flat interest, how they are calculating that 15% and they also have a fee of 2%. So then the, the third bank says 12% interest, well that's lower, and a 1% fee, that's lower, and they explain this benefit they have, they help you save. It's a, let's say it's a thousand dollar loan, $200 goes in a savings account, and then you pay a thousand, and then at the end you have $200 of savings that you've accumulated, okay? There's a fourth bank, and they say 30% interest, declining balance interest, no fees, no savings. So what loan would you pick? How would you compare these loans? All the power lies in the hands of the lender. So, so this is not a problem that's unique to microfinance. In the United States, consumer lending practiced the same thing and led Congress to pass in 1968 the Truth in Lending Act. By that law, you as a consumer have a right to know the true price, and it's called the APR. An APR of, say, 10% means that uh, if you borrow $1 and keep that $1 for one year, you pay 10 cents in interest. It's very nice unit measurement, okay? A lower APR, a lower price, and you can use that to compare which loan to buy. So let's go back to these and see what are the true prices of those four loans, okay? The first loan at 0% interest has an APR of 50%. The second loan with tw that says 12% interest, really when you run that through the, e the equation, has, let's see if the, we get this word, has an APR of 50%. Okay? The third loan that looked lower, also guess what, has an, a true price of 50%. And the last loan that looked so expensive, 30%, is a transparent price, and the APR is 30%. It's, looked the most expensive, but it is by far the lowest of those four options. So here's the situation. If you can charge a higher price than the comp competition and hide that price from your clients, you have the opportunity to make a lot of profit, okay? That's quite tempting. Is it ethical? Most would say no. Is it legal? And yes, it is, unless there's a truth in lending law and in few countries where microfinance works, is that the case? Okay. So with hidden prices, the reality is the market isn't working. You've seen the way we do pricing. Clearly the invisible hand of the market can't work when there are invisible prices. Okay. So how are prices set? They're not set by the market. They are, competition is not setting the prices. Managers are choosing their prices and choosing how much to hide their prices. I find that most managers in microfinance are setting reasonable prices and generating reasonable profits, but some are choosing to maximize profit. And without the transparent data, we cannot distinguish those two groups. So there's another wrinkle. What's almost unique about microfinance is that we're an industry with virtually all of our clients at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Four billion people live on less than just a few dollars a day. Those are our clients. And if we choose to make profit, the profit is coming out of the pockets of the poor. How much profit is too much profit when you, when you call yourself a social business? So this was five years ago. We saw this hidden prices, high profits. I could see what was happening, but I was uncertain how we could challenge this. So I worked with some colleagues and we came up with the idea to start a consumer protection initiative to, to get the data and recognize those that were behaving more responsibly. We founded this on two principles. First, a principle from the Quakers right here in, in Philadelphia, speak truth to power. And the second, demand transparency. Transparency is an amazing principle. It means operating in a way that others can see actions performed. Just yesterday I heard a comment on an NPR show that said, abuses of power thrive in darkness. Transparency puts everything in light. Okay. Marketing principles say trust us, and with trust there's always room for doubt and deception. 
and with transparency that doubt disappears. And it's like living in a glass house before decisions are made in closed rooms. Now, if your true price is known, aren't you going to address that, how you set your price differently than you were doing previously? So we decided to take a step forward. This was five years ago. We scheduled for an opening plenary ses session at a global conference. And I stood up somewhat nervously and said, we've been hiding our true prices for decades. We see now the consequences. This is wrong. We must stop. I wasn't sure what the reaction would come, but that announcement created a spark that others were waiting for. It's, it's like the, the story of the emperor has no clothes. You see something, it looks really strange. Nobody's saying anything about that. You feel led to say what you see. And then others breathe a sigh of relief and say they're in agreement. So we started, so the next day, the, the, the story of our organization was in the global press, including the homepage of businessweek.com. We were nothing but an idea at that time. We had little money or staff, and we set out to quickly address this problem. And despite those challenges, we worked in a total of 30 countries and met with the lenders, got the pricing data from them, and published it for, uh, with, for data from over 500 lenders on loans going to over 50 million clients, 80% of those women. People started in the industry started using that data to determine who to best, who they should best work with, who's acting responsibly. Okay, there are many challenges to, store, to go. This task is rather enormous, and I run a very small organization. The key is that we haven't done any of this alone. We do it in close work with many others. The small actions of many people add up to big results. And that brings me back to that original point I made at the beginning, that individuals have the potential to play surprising roles in light sparks that motivate others. Eunice did not expect when he gave that money to those women the first time that he was creating a global movement. My personal story today is, is, is extremely minor in comparison, but we operated under the same motivational principles. I'll tell you the truth, when I incorporated microfinance transparency, I expected it to fail. When those headlines were running and we were on the homepage of businessweek.com, we had no funding and no staff. It was simply an idea I was throwing out there. I took a risk and I expected failure. I took that risk because I felt I had a responsibility to try something rather than just walk away. And for these five years, uh, I've been the manager of a tiny nonprofit. I'm just an average person who lives in a small town, and I made some rather common sense statements like, the poor, don't they have a right to know the true price? Despite all that, some rather unexpected things happened. One of the wildest is that despite nobody knowing who I am, I was invited to speak in front of 70,000 people with Dr. Eunice at a Coldplay concert a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody expected that to happen, least of all me. Okay. What I said to that crowd is very similar to what I'm saying to you today, and with this I want to close, that each of us, we see problems in our neighborhoods, we see problems in the broader global world, we feel empathetic, and we hope somebody does something, but we ourselves feel inadequate, or we feel the problem is too big, some people do something anyway. They do what their conscience leads them to do, and then sometimes magic happens. The magic of other people being motivated and continuing that idea. Those first actions come when people are determined to take responsibility to tackle a problem they didn't create. I found an interesting quote that reflects that, and I want to share this with you now, the, the words of Abraham Heschel, a German theologian who was examining the course of problems throughout history and found a common thread. In, indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. 
In a free society, few are guilty, but all are responsible. I believe we're all responsible for demanding justice for others. If we don't, justice will erode. My vision is that all of us will be inspired to perform the actions our hearts lead us to do. Thanks.